Tonight, of course, we'll be discussing the results of the French election of the second tour that took place on Sunday. Um, and at stake, as, as, we, as we will discuss, is the identity of the Fifth Republic as the French people chose or abstained <laughs> uh, to align themselves with Macron, uh, possibly rejecting a nationalist picture of a once strong France in decline. We might pose that as a question. What will happen, we might ask, to immigration, secularism, security, and social cohesion in France in the election's wake? This will just be one of many questions that we will broach this evening uh, with the help of many journalists uh, behind me. I'm David Andelman. I'm, I'm with the Overseas Press Club and at CNN. It's my privilege to serve as the moderator of this uh, second of what we hope will be a long series of extraordinary American Library of Paris um, uh, events. You know, I want to take you back uh, 41 years when I was serving as Paris correspondent for CBS News. I covered my first French presidential election when Francois Mitterrand upset Valérie Giscard d'Estaing for a second five-year term and became the first socialist to lead France since Léon Blum. Uh, for the past four months, I've been chronicling this latest election for my new Substack page, Andelman Unleashed, and for CNN Opinion. And now, somehow, we've we've gotten we've gotten through all of this. Um, uh, most fraught campaign uh, fought in the midst of war and pandemic and somehow precisely how we'll be exploring today how we got through it and how we might get out of it and what might be happening next in France and around Europe and the world. To do this, we've assembled a, just a fabulous group of experts from four countries, all journalists on both sides of the Atlantic to explore this very question, all fresh off the campaign trail here in, in one fashion or another. So let me introduce them and we can plunge right in. On the far right, nothing to do with our politics, trust me. My organizer, Vivian, co-organizer, Vivian Walt, a fellow OPC governor, uh, a veteran correspondent of Time and Fortune based in Paris and travels around the world, a lot in the Middle East, by the way. Um, on the other extreme, at the other, uh, the left end of the spectrum, which he says does not necessarily reflect the interests, or perhaps it does of the Financial Times, but uh, there we are. Uh, Victor Mallet is Paris bureau chief, for the London-based Financial Times. Uh, next to him, immediately to my left, um, again, no political uh, uh, innuendos, Sarah Payou is, president, is presidential campaign reporter for France's Journal de Dimanche. I first came upon her when she's done some, just some marvelous reporting following Macron, particularly around the country, uh, and seems to have really uh, gotten behind the, the veil there. And finally, immediately to my right um, is Nadia Pantel, She's chief Paris correspondent for the German daily Süddeutsche Zeitung, the great Munich daily, a national newspaper in Germany, um, and has actually even met the both the or knew either the both the former and the current German chancellor. So that's that's very exciting. Now, what better place to start than Monday morning, when the magazine Le Point pointed out, defeated the candidate of the national rally managed to raise her party to an unprecedented level, a fragile position. So where is the right right now? Where is it headed? And where can Macron, what can Macron do to, to basically to stop its growth or at least to stop its um, uh, reaching some of its priorities? We should probably start in this case with our French campaign reporter, Sarah, since um, you were with Macron, how worried is he or how worried should he be about, you know, the um, l'extreme droite, as we say? What should he do to, to stop his, its growth? Yes, and, and uh, how does he set an agenda going forward? And what kind of an agenda can that be with the, the right wing so, you know, so apparently in such a strong position? Yeah, it's true that the, the, the far right is in strong position in France. Marine Le Pen lost, but she lost well, if I can say. Uh, the thing is, um, until the next presidential election, there will be a lot of local election in which the far right usually doesn't have such good results. Uh, so this will be at stake for Marine Le Pen and, far, and the far right in France if they want to continue to exist in the political um, uh, field, is to exist um, even though they won't be able to have good results. Uh, for Emmanuel Macron, of course, there is a responsibility because even though Marine Le Pen during the last five years wasn't so, um, visible in, in, in the field. I mean, there were other people much more visible than her from the right or the, 
speaking about Jean-Luc Mélenchon in the far left, uh, but she managed still to increase her influence in the country. So that's very difficult to fight an, uh, an enemy that doesn't speak or not, 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 much, not much and, and doesn't do so much things since she doesn't have any power locally. And, and, not, and, only that, and not only that, she, going forward, of course, she has right now only six members of the National Assembly of 577 members. If she's going to make any kind of a headway, she has to suddenly do some amazing work in the next uh, legislation, legislative elections. Yeah. Totally. I'm not, I'm, I'm not uh, sure at all that she'll be able to uh, form a group in the parliament. You need to have uh, 15 uh, members of parliament to form a group in the parliament. I'm not sure at all that she'll be able to do so, which is a problem, actually. Even the supporters of Emmanuel Macron say that this is a problem, that Marine Le Pen and her ideas, uh, de not depending on what, what we think about, about them, are not um, representing in the parliament when almost uh, one out of uh, two French voters chooses her. She, it's a it's democratic issue. You know, that, that's, that's very interesting. And um, I, I like to turn next to Europe even more broadly. Um, seems at least Europe breathes a um, sort of a particular sigh of relief. Um, but is this really premature? Victor, I know you've been especially looking at the election's impact on markets. Um, more broadly, is France now truly in a leadership position in Europe? And is it just something that Macron can capitalize going forward? Uh, yes. I mean, I think, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that he did win the election fairly handsomely. So everyone <laughs> is sort of agonizing about the rise of the far right. He, he won very convincingly in, in this election. And certainly, um, in terms of what he, that means he can continue pushing forward his European agenda. And I think it's worth remembering his Sorbonne speech back in 2017, which was extremely ambitious. He came up with all these wild ideas for European uh, advancement, integration, European sovereignty and autonomy. Like, you know, Europe should do more for its defense. It should have common uh, budgeting for economic purposes. Uh, and so on. And, 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 and at the time, the Germans were very annoyed about this. And they thought, you know, he was being a bit overambitious and should have consulted them first before coming up with these wild plans. And now after the COVID pandemic, after uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we see really that actually he was quite prophetic and his views on the need for stronger European industry, for less dependence on global supply chains. He wasn't thinking about pharmaceuticals. He was thinking about things like electric vehicles. But you know, the, 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 the point still stands and the need for more defense autonomy in Europe, that really has all come true. And the Germans recently announced you know, a big increase in their own defense spending. So that's kind of, so yes, he will push forward all those things. Um, I, I think it's just, and, and he will have the ability to do so. He's, he's like a European senior statesman now that, now, now that Merkel has gone and been replaced by, by Schultz, who is less experienced. Um, but I think it's worth putting all this in a kind of, you know, the, the election in, in an international perspective and, and realizing that although Macron will be able to push his agenda forward, he is, um, I mean, he's one of the, perhaps few isn't the right word, but there aren't as many remaining liberal democracies that are you know centrist and, and liberal and and so on uh, left in the world now we have an extraordinary situation where you know we had the brexit vote in 2016 we had trump elected the same year and then all around the world you've seen democracies fall under the control of authoritarians or in some cases dictators uh, russia being the most obvious example but uh, you know the same has happened in Brazil and the Philippines and Turkey and so on, and 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 even in Hungary. If, if France can be left out, in fact, because I mean, uh, after all, uh, you know, there were over forty percent of the people of France voted for. Yes. For her. So 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 that is the, the 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 context is that France is for the moment staving this off, but uh, the the far right and indeed the extremes of all sides, you know, the the, the far left here is quite a nationalist protectionist far left. Uh, I mean. That, that was six, you know, the far right and the far left combined was 60% of the vote in the first round. So you have a, a really extraordinary situation where uh, Macron is still holding the center and he is the kind of probably the leading, uh, you know, apart from the United States and Japan, you know, he is a sort of big representative of Western liberal democracy. But France, as are, you know, the US and, and other countries, is kind of under siege from this very anti internationalist nationalist, populist in many cases, 
kind of movement that has taken hold in, in Britain's taken hold in the US under Trump, although there was a sort of slight reversion with Biden, and we don't know how long that will last. But you know, this is a, a kind of very, well, it's a very interesting and slightly worrying moment in world history. I think if you're a liberal, if you describe yourself as a liberal and a Democrat, this is not a very easy time to be living. I like to describe the, um, the French political scene as a, um, usually in the United States, we think of it as a, a a linear line, straight line from left to right. Uh, in the United States, I like to, uh, in, in France, I, I like to think of it more as an oval, where the two extremes sort of meet at the bottom, and they um, and that's exactly what seems to be happening here. And it's so um, next up, next up is Victor mentioned this. Um, uh, the question is, we we have a new um, a leader in Germany. Uh, we have a we have a um, a leader in France who is, likes to think that he is going to be uh, uh, assuming the um, the leadership role in in Europe. Um, that uh, you know, he's the um, uh, he's he's the person that the rest of Europe needs to look up to, as they once did uh, Angela Merkel, the uh, former chancellor in Germany, and that France needs to take the leading role. And of course, for the six month period, he, France does have the rotating leadership of Europe. So, um, the last time we gathered in, in here in December in this very room, Merkel had just been transitioning out of her role not only as Germany's chancellor but also the effective leader of the continent. Macron had been lusting after this role. Um, as I noted earlier this year, um, in one column I wrote, uh, he's sort of been become Europe's sort of Putin whisperer, uh, the one person who can really talk to Putin and understand Putin and interpret him to the West. But so Nina, um, Germany, um, is it prepared to give up this role to France now that Macron's securing another five years in power? And does Schultz really have the kind of clout to 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 hold France at bay in in some respects now? To hold France? Yes, France to hold bay. France you know, and, and, it's, and continue its role as a leadership, as a leader in Europe. Yes. Um, does this work? Okay. No. Yeah. No. Well, yeah, <laughs> but you look like you can hear me, so I will. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, I don't think German politics work in a way that there is a conscious decision of saying, we want leadership or we give it to somebody else. Like even also Angela Merkel, she was a leader by default because at some point there was nobody else taking that role. Um, you, you mentioned Brexit, you, you mentioned the election of Trump. Um, and, I don't, and we just talked about that. I don't think anybody saw Angela Merkel as a emerging world leader when she became the German chancellor. That's a role that she grew into. And um, well, first of all, the re-election of Macron is very good news for Germany because um, France is Germany's closest partner. And if Marine Le Pen would have won the election, there would have been um, not only a Putin ally uh, in the Elysee Palace, but also somebody who has a very strong anti-German rhetoric and a very strong anti-German mind frame. So that for now is very good news. Um, and when, when Victor was saying, well, Germany was even a little bit annoyed by uh, this ambition of Macron when it comes to EU issues, that's not Germany, but that is the CDU, um, the party of Angela Merkel, who mostly had the first question, okay, but what does this cost us? And um, now we have a different coalition running the country, this Feu uh, Tricolore, the traffic light coalition, that is a bit like Macron split up into three parties, right? You have a little bit of social democracy, you have some conservative parts in it too, you have a strong liberal agenda when it comes to economy, and some climate protection too, which is sort of Macron rolled up. But <laughs> um, And I think when you ask, will Germany give leadership to, to Macron, that's not a question of giving it, but like just a situation that will present itself and it will most probably happen that way, right? Um, but, but, but why? I mean, what, what is there about um, what, what is there about the, um, the, the the position of Germany, particularly the, 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 the current German chancellor that was that was that was changed, that was different from when it was under uh, when, when Merkel was in power? Because Macron was, after all, was was president of France even then. Yes, um, and and like I said, we have we have a different different coalition now, but. Um, I think the Scholz running the country now has a problem because of 
we all have a problem because of Russia's invasion in Ukraine, but Scholz has a particular problem because maybe some of you saw this interview in the New York Times with uh, our former Chancellor Gerhard Schröder, who is not an elected politician anymore, but a lobbyist for Russian gas. Um, and he's still in the, in, the, in the party that is running our country. Um, so, and with a million dollar salary, year yes, salary. Yes, and that, that creates a problem for the SPD right now. So Germany is also in a position of finding itself um, on how to place itself in this particular moment on the international scene. So Germany is weakened while France is strengthened with the re-election of, of Macron. Okay, now America, Viv, <laughs> this is your thing, well, among many others, but um, look, France and America have had a pretty rocky relationship in recent years, you're nodding your head knowingly, yes. First Trump, then a mess in Afghanistan, then the Australian submarine deal, which now seems to be coming apart at the seams, um, thanks to what China is doing over there, which is uh, creating a degree of schadenfreude in, in the alias age, what I hear. But um, So is Macron now in a more powerful position to call the shots? And, and how should Washington respond? Where, where are we in all of this right now? Well, might I say, I did, I did start my election piece on Sunday night, which ran right after the polls closed, saying that you could hear the sighs of relief from Paris to Brussels and all the way to Washington. And I really think the sense of relief um, in the White House must have been quite overwhelming um, because the alternative would have been really disastrous. Um, it would have been a kind of reversal of what Macron essentially suffered through with Trump for four years. Um, so um, I think that, yes, in some ways, um, Macron can kind of um, find his footing again with the US, um, knowing that he doesn't face the kind of specter of, um, of a re-election fight. Um, and also knowing that he's right on the doorstep of Ukraine. Um, he has Zelensky's ear, obviously, so does Blinken and Biden and everybody else, but uh, Macron can get there very quickly, and I'm sure he will in the next days. I expect he will be in Kiev pretty soon. Boris Johnson's um, already been there. Pardon? Boris Johnson has already been there. Right, Boris Johnson's already been there. Blinken and Lloyd Austin were just there. And um, I expected, uh, I, I mean, I, I imagined on Sunday night that uh, we would very shortly hear that uh, Macron was on his way to Kiev. So, um, and of course, he also, until recently anyway, has had the ear of Putin. Not that it really helped anything, but he clearly has made a tactical decision, which I think is the correct one, that he has to keep the line open to Putin. Um, I think it was part of his strategic thinking um, in deciding that he was not gonna call what was happening in Ukraine a genocide, and that words actually do have consequences, um, which ultimately you might not want. So um, I think that Macron has been you know, really quite amazing to witness. I've interviewed him four times over the past um, six years. Um, twice he wound up on the cover of Time magazine. Um, and the first time he wound up on the cover of Time magazine, I think it was six months after his 2017 election. And the headline on the cover was the next leader of Europe. And then at the bottom, there was a little asterisk which said, if only he can lead France. So, um, and at the time I was like, I said to my editors, Jesus, you know, we, we like struggled so hard to get this interview, we get this big interview and now you're gonna like throw it in his face. But actually it turned out to be a smart headline. And, um, and indeed what happened right after that was the emergence of the Gilets Jaunes and yes, he is the next leader of Europe. He is now the leader of Europe. I think it's hard to dispute that, but he does need to manage France. And whether it's in his relationships with Washington or Brussels or Berlin, 
or Beijing, um, he cannot be seen to be presiding over a country where people are smashing storefronts and burning barricades in the street. Um, and that is something he is going to have to deal with. I, I think the, the odd thing about France, and I think for us Americans particularly, it's kind of always baffling, is how pessimistic people are. On every single poll, France is the most pessimistic country in the entire European Union, and one of the most pessimistic in the world. And we come here as as Americans, it's like, oh my God, this is paradise. Um, and uh, it's very baffling to us. And it's also baffling as to how negative people are about President Macron, given all the alternatives. So um, I, I think there is something innate um, about the political culture in France, which I don't have an answer for, but which continues to be a question for me in my reporting and um, which shows up in a lot of headlines. Um, and um, I, I don't know how to answer that. I, I was especially struck by your comment about the first um, um, cover with the, uh, the asterisk, if you can control France. Um, within a year or so after he became president, uh, Barack Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize. And um, I had a lunch in New York several years later with the um, chairman of the committee that gives out the Nobel Peace Prize. And I asked him, um, between us, entirely between us, of course, this is many years ago, so I can, I can, I can confidentially now tell you all about what he said. I said, would, would, was, would you have given him that award now? And he said, he said, we might have wanted to wait a little while longer. And so, <laughs> so anyway, um, you did wait, and Macron was reelected. So that's, that's I guess, an, a, a, an encouraging sign. Before we had the questions from our audience here or out there. Um, I want to throw this open to all of our panelists, uh, Ukraine and Putin. Clearly, it's a huge loss for Putin. Um, it was a huge loss for Putin Sunday night. Um, and so everybody said, uh, I said it in my lead of my, my CNN column, uh, 1200, uh, Putin's greatest defeat in, in, um, in, 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 since the war began probably was 1200 miles uh, west of Kiev um, in, uh, in France. Um, uh, so what does this mean for the war and for France's role in it and for Putin? I mean, does anybody have any thoughts about it? Um, Sarah, Victor, anybody? Well, is it working? Yeah, it is. Well, I'm not sure. Of course, um, the election of Marine Le Pen would have been a huge good news for Vladimir Putin. But is really the re-election of Emmanuel Macron a bad news for him? I'm not sure about it. Since the beginning, Emmanuel Macron tried to discuss with Vladimir Putin, uh, was really uh, leading the, I'm sorry, maybe it's my French pessimism that is talking, but he tried um, to, to prevent the worst from happening and it is happening. So I'm not sure Emmanuel Macron will have uh, the power to stop Vladimir Putin. I'm not sure Vladimir Putin really cares. And which was um, something that was really frightening is that he wished a good health to Emmanuel Macron on the night of his election, which was a bit frightening for us. Yeah, I just think, you know, we should sort of, again, we should set this all in, in the sort of global context, because, um, you, you know, it seems to me that if, if Putin had just taken the Donbass, eastern Ukraine, which is more or less what he did in 2014, you know, uh, and, and what he tried to do with Georgia and what he's done to Moldova, what would the West have done? Basically nothing. There would have been some minor sanctions and everyone would have sat back with a sigh of relief. Putin sort of crossed a red line by flagrantly invading a sovereign nation and trying to, trying to destroy it, basically, and, you know, which led to that historic vote in the UN General Assembly, which was, I think, you know, quite remarkable that so many countries, admittedly not the not much more than half the world's population, but so many countries has came on side. So in a way, you know, if, yes, of course it would have been bad technically, uh, you know, it would have been good for Putin if, uh, if, if Le Pen had won. Um, but I just think, um, you know, the, the whole, this is a very significant moment in, in world history because the, the liberal democracies of the world, they need Putin to lose this because the knock-on effects 
of him not losing are so catastrophic. I mean, you just will see a complete destabilization of the world. You will see China, uh, you know, given permission, as it were, to do what it wants in Taiwan and the whole of the Pacific. You will see authoritarian states everywhere, including, you know, people who support Donald Trump of course, doing whatever have, they want. You have to define what, what losing is, right? I mean, yeah. there have been people who yes. are suggesting that, that at yeah. some point Putin is just going to say, he's going to do a, 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 George, a George W. Bush moment, uh, mission accomplished, right? Okay, I've won. Um, and, and then that's it. And then... Yeah, but he, I mean, he has to be shown to be defeated to the rest right. of the world, right. regardless of whether he can pull something out of the hat for his own people. I think, yeah. you know, the... the uh, yeah, anyway. sure. Okay. Uh, some... Yes. Um, even though we know that now Macron won, um, I still find it impressive that at this point in time, the like in the first round of this election, after Emmanuel Macron, the next three candidates the, who came for, like, yeah, did I speak up? Okay. <laughs> um, either are open admirers of Putin, which is true for Le Pen and true for Zemmour, or are pretty stuck in the 80s mind frame when it comes to geopolitics, which is true for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who sees the main risk in US imperialism. And these people were, were very successful at the moment in time when Russia invaded Ukraine. So it tells you that people don't necessarily care. Like a lot of people just didn't care about this war. And I remember- um, in, that, Fran in France, I, right. I, I don't know. How about in, in Germany? We, I think it's a different situation in Germany because what I find really interesting is that the coverage of this war in France is much better than in Germany. There are much many more reporters doing actual reporting from the front in Ukraine on television. Because and, there are a lot of people watching, which is one of the first, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, but yeah. I, I talked about um, uh, colleagues from uh, TV and they were very surprised that the matter was uh, such a success in terms of audience, sorry to like that about people dying but that's also a reality and but then they don't care like yeah. it's weird they mm -hmm. watch it they watch it a lot they see it a lot it's very explicit don't feel concerned like and they this. don't feel concerned like because the reporting is worse in germany but when there was the big there was a big solidarian demonstration for ukraine in in uh, berlin like two weeks prior to the first round of these elections here in france and 100,000 people went to the street in berlin to show solidarity for ukraine and I went to Place de la République here in Paris four days later, and I was like, <laughs> who will be there? And first I met the France Insoumise who was demonstrating for women's rights. Then there was some people from Tunisia demonstrating for free media. And then there was a small fraction of people showing solidarity with Ukraine. Right, right, but, so but the, and, and we've looked at the polls and, and what were the most important issues, the most important, overwhelmingly important issue in France was the economy, was uh, the pouvoir d'achat, the, the purchasing power. Yeah, right. I, I, I am, you know, I was, I was quite surprised also that uh, Le Pen, I had thought, had destroyed all her election pamphlets uh, that had the photo of her shaking hands with Putin in her visit to the Kremlin in 2017. Um, and in fact, then I went traveling around the north of France with campaign workers from Le Pen, and I was sitting in the back seat of their car. It was a huge, like up to the ceiling, pile of Le Pen election pamphlets that they were, they were correcting, out. That they were passing and out. There, <laughs> right in the, in the middle, was this big, this, this photo of her shaking hands with Putin. Um, yeah, where there were like thousands yeah. of them. Right. Um, no one cared. I mean, it was her showing that she was a big global leader, and um, and people didn't care. You never heard the word. Ukraine, um, you could travel. I imagine you could travel around there for weeks and not hear the word Ukraine. Um, people, people spoke about pensions, wages, and the cost of living, and that's and that is for real. I mean, that's that is really what is hurting people and yeah. a lot of people. D and, different situation in Eastern Europe, of course, where you know oh, yeah. in Poland. Um, but this thing about the cost of living is, is is really interesting because imagine what would have happened if there hadn't been a war uh, and therefore the cost of, uh, or there hadn't been a crisis before the war, the cost of fuel wouldn't have gone up very much. Uh, the cost of food wouldn't have gone up. 
and really Marine Le Pen's very successful campaign was based on, on that issue of inflation. And any incumbent government, particularly elected government, is going to have a problem right now, including Biden in the US, including uh, you know, Boris Johnson's government in the UK. They've all got problems from this, from this issue of inflation, which is well, very and, much and exacerbated by the war. You would also have had COVID would have been more of a, a discussion point, probably. And his, how he Not in France, COVID. I don't think. Right. Not now. Yeah. It, it was a while back, but right. much less than it was. Yeah. Okay. So um, should we go to questions? Um, uh, so, um, so here's a situation. Um, well, um, Alice is going to give us the, um, the, 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 the brief on that. Um. Uh, yes, we will open up to your questions in the room. And also we have questions on Zoom. Uh, so you're welcome to post your question on Zoom and we'll try and get to as many as possible. Before we do that, I'd love to represent the uh, disenchanted youth and get your opinions on uh, Mélenchon more, uh, you know, lest we forget that Macron won in the first round 27.9%, um, uh, Le Pen 23.2%, and Mélenchon 22%, and all over Paris, you know, certainly at Sciences Po and the Sorbonne, there were huge protests uh, for basically from kind of my generation. Um, feeling very at odds with the prospect of voting either for Macron or Le Pen in the second round. Can you talk about um, this 22% and also the abstention rate in, in the second round? Does anyone and, want to answer and, that? And, 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 um, and Mélenchon's aspirations to become the next prime minister of France. <laughs> um, do you want to begin that, sir, since he, he's talking about um, becoming the next prime minister of France? Well, I actually want to... Um, went to vote with two, uh, one 23 year old and one 24 year old on Sunday um, who voted as a reporter, um, who voted for Mélenchon in the first round and who now voted for Macron. And they were both saying, well, we don't even particularly like Mélenchon, like especially as young women, we feel like he's not a very pleasant character because he's so authoritative and um, chauvinist also in his ways of being. But um, for us, he's the only candidate who actually talked about the climate crisis. And that matters so much to us that he was our natural candidate. And yet, and and yet Yannick Jadot, who was the, the ecology candidate, got a very tiny percentage of the vote. Well, because he ended up talking only about Ukraine and blaming Mélenchon for his, <laughs> <laughs> um, his closeness to, his closeness to, uh, to, to Putin. So, um, and for them, this was this was their strong point. This is what we want to vote. And then one of them was saying something to me when you talk about the disenchanted youth. She said, um, I feel like around me there are either people who, who are completely locked out of politics, who don't care at all anymore, or who are people like me and my friend who really engage. And um, they were very, they were really active in uh, in climate protests and these things, and that's why they vote for Mélenchon. So Sarah, what, what about the chances of uh, Mélenchon becoming prime minister, as you said that he is his aspiration? Well, I, I think it will be very difficult for him. Um, I, I doubt this will happen, but it will be fun as a journalist to see if this happens. <laughs> <laughs> but I think his chances are really depending on the capacity of all the left-wing parties to ally and to manage to um, have only one uh, competitor per electoral division. If they don't manage to do it, it's sure Jean-Luc Mélenchon and the left-wing parties won't win the, the parliamentary elections. If they manage to do so, to get a deal all together, they can pretend to have a, a huge group in, in the National Assembly, maybe the second one, but I don't see how Emmanuel Macron doesn't get uh, a, a majority in, in, in the National Assembly in June. Still an absolute majority. Mm. So basically the, 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 the lesser parties, the um, Republicans, the Socialists, um, the uh, Greens and so on, they're basically all finished, even though they were once the major parties in France. Um, and and uh, his new, um, um, uh, LREM party, um, Macron's, that will still be the leading party in France, in your view? I don't really know what will happen in, in the next years, because um, the party LREM is, is really linked to Emmanuel Macron. And in five years, he won't be able to uh, run for election again. So I don't know what will happen to LREM without Emmanuel Macron. I mean, even the first name of the party was uh, En Marche. 
so the initials were EM. That were the initials of Emmanuel Macron, which shows you how much he, I didn't even is, think of that. That's he is linked to the party. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and there are already a lot of people thinking about in uh, LROM, uh, thinking about 2027, saying that if uh, it's that one that is running, I, I will stop politics, I will stop um, being in LRM, etc. So I, I, I don't, I really don't know what will happen. I don't know if LRM will still be the leading party in the country, if the Socialist Party and the Republicans want to um, come back from these terrible defeats for them. From the dead, let's say it. Yeah, <laughs> we can say that. They will have to make a huge work on ideas, on on uh, new um, political leaders in among among the parties. And by, and by that time, Mélenchon will be 75 years old, so... Um... Yeah, that's that's that the, the the next election is really full of uh, um, mysteries because the question is Jean Luc Mélenchon. We all think it, it was his last campaign. Uh, it was the case for Marine Le Pen too. Well, a few days back. Now she seems that it seems that she will be there in 2027 <laughs> for a pleasure. But um, how well, many campaigns did her, her father run? Right. Mm. Yeah. Can I just say something about the electoral system, about, you know, the alienation of young voters and Mélenchon voters? I think it's very important that people always sort of forget that you, you, you vote in the electoral system that you have in the country you have. And the French system is quite peculiar if you're American or British, the, the system of having two rounds. I think it was Mitterrand who said in the first round, you choose the person you like. And in the second round, you reject the person you don't like. Right. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is that in the second round, for a lot of people, they don't like either of them. You know, right. this was the, the problem. And but I, I don't think that sort of makes it undemocratic. I think it just means that's the system that France yeah. has. And unless you change that system, you have to live with it. So I think people who go around saying, you know, he's not legitimately elected. I mean, people said the same thing about Thatcher in, in the UK and, you know, who was a very popular prime minister at the time because, you know, the British system has a first past the post where you only need to win each constituency with more votes than all the others. You don't have to have more than 50%. So, you know, it's just a, a function of the system that people feel quite left out. Let's just hope they don't go for a, uh, an electoral college here in France. And, you know. um, yeah, exactly. Yep. I, you know, I, I, and by the way, um, you know, this 18 to 24 year old um, age group, 61% of that age group voted for Macron. Now there was, there was, I forget what the abstention rate was for that age group, it was pretty high. Um, but those who went out to vote were overwhelmingly for Macron. So- um, In the second round, yeah. In the second round, yeah, we're talking about the second round. They, you know, 39% of them chose Le Pen. So I think that's another thing that's worth noting. Um, and, uh, you know, I was most struck um, by one of the statistics that came out um, from one of the polling agencies after the election saying that most people polled said that they want a cohabitation government. They want a different party in the National Assembly. They probably won't get it. But, um, you know, I think that they forget and they should only just look over to the US to see what a totally gridlocked political system looks like, um, where you can literally like not get anything done. Um, and they might reevaluate that. But um, which, has, which has happened here under cohabitation, which is a cohabitation, which we could conceivably have. It's not inconceivable. So you're right. OK, folks, um, question time. Yes, right? question time in the audience. Yes. So I've been thinking a lot about this slogan and Go to what you were saying about is it democratic or not? The French slogan, ni banker ni fascist. Are those the only options left? A, a, a neoliberal or a fascist? And is that really democratic? I mean, is that really democracy? I don't know. I, I don't think so, but. They could have chosen, first of all, they could have chosen the other candidate in the first round and they lost, you know. If, if they'd wanted somebody who wasn't a banker or a fascist, they should have voted in the first round. And maybe they did. But if you if you don't get your candidate into the second round, you don't get to choose your candidate. Mélenchon lost very narrowly. One percent. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, but he did the same. 
the previous time, in the previous French election in 2017, it was very close. It was within a few hundred thousand votes of having Le Pen and Mélenchon, a far left and a far right candidate, in the second round. It didn't actually happen. Macron got in. The, the only other thing I would say is I think it's a bit unfair to describe, um, you know, to sort of uh, to pinpoint them with those very narrow descriptions. You know, I mean, yeah, sure, but that's but that's because it's a slogan. You know, to say that Macron is a neoliberal even is is questionable. I think you know it, it's a it's a kind of term of abuse if you're a, a left wing French person, but it's not necessarily true in the case of Macron. He's actually quite a complicated centrist, internationalist, liberal. You know, anyway. Just, we have, a, we have a question on Zoom um, from M. So just to acknowledge, we have 145 people on Zoom uh, from all over the world, Paris, Nice, New York, uh, Massachusetts, Illinois, Cleveland, Ohio, Texas, Mexico City. Um, so hello to our international audience. MD and Leonard asked, do you not, so just picking up on your discussion of French uh, pessimism, do you not think that this famous pessimism of French people also comes from the fact that Macron continues to push neoliberal policies in some ways that puts France closer to America in terms of how workers are treated and perhaps French workers, not just citizens, are fighting to keep these social benefits that they seem uh, to be losing little by little? You know, the, in, oh, sorry. In the box. Uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, um, in the in the box. I mean, in fact, if you look at the numbers, um, uh, France is is before before redistribution of taxes. Uh, France is a sort of relatively unequal society, although not particularly unequal compared, I think, to the United States and Hong Kong. But after redistribution, and the the French state uh, spends more than any other major economy. Uh, you know, on state spending, social security, and so on, France is actually one of the most equal societies on the planet. So it, it's really important to remember that, you know, with, with uh, I think something like, well, last year, because of the COVID pandemic, uh, it was, you know, more than 60% of GDP was government spending, which is a massive redistribution of, of resources from taxpayers to people who need it in terms of health, education, and all the rescue packages uh, for, the, for the COVID economy. So it's true there's a perception in France. Uh, I think, you know, as everyone's saying, everyone's very pessimistic and they think they're hard done by. And, you know, France is famously a country where people live in paradise and think they live in hell. Um, but actually, um, you know, spending power during Macron's term, I mean, I'm not sort of speaking as his advocate, but the fact is that actually uh, purchasing power did actually go up quite a lot in his five years in power. The other thing that everyone forgets is that unemployment went down to a you know, record low for the past 15 years. And he got no credit for that because nobody cares about unemployment anymore because it's not as much of a problem as it was. I would just like to say one other thing. I think that um, yeah. uh, Macron in his next term is really going to be looking for history. He doesn't have to worry about being reelected. He doesn't have to worry about, um, you know, whether, you know, what, what certain blocks are thinking about or whatever. He's going to be looking at his role in French history and in European history and in global history. And I think he wants to establish a record that will really change this country um, dramatically and that might not necessarily be immediately perceptible to the people who are living in it, but that will, in fact, at some point in time, really begin to bear fruit in the future. And uh, he's only be, remember, 40, between 49, something like 49 years old when he leaves office. When he leaves office, he will be 49 years old. He will be the same age as my son now. OK, and he will never again be able to run a country again, ever. Um, now I've often thought that people 50 years old or older is when they really begin to get the wisdom to run a country and he will never be able to do that. So he's really, I think, in this next five years, he's going to uh, really I think he's going to try to make his mark on, on the country. Sarah, do you, you followed him very closely? What, what do you think about that? Well, I do agree agree with uh, your analysis. A lot of um, close, uh, very close counselors to Emmanuel Macron uh, talk to me about his will to mark history and to be able to, um, in five years, to look back at what he did and say, okay, in, in 10 or 15 years or even, I don't know, a century, I will be remembered because I did that. So yeah, he, he will be, but um, as you said, maybe in five years, we won't be able to say Emmanuel Macron will be remembered for that. Maybe we'll have to wait uh, 20 years 
to realize what uh, Emmanuel Mempel did to our country or not, if he succeed uh, to, to, to leave this, this trace in history. And then it only would barely be 70 years old at that point. <laughs> okay, next question. Are there any more questions? Yes. Why are autocrats gaining power at the expense of democracy? And is the younger generation at the center of this movement? I'd be interested to hear what a German uh, correspondent would say about that, who's looked at both Germany and France. Um. <laughs> I had a lot to say to the question before that. Um, but no. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't, one or the other. I don't, um, I'm, I'm unsure about that because I think it's important what um, what you just said about the 61% of the 18 to uh, 24 year olds who decided to then go, even though Macron was really not the candidate of their first choice, who then went to the second round of the election um, and who voted um, much more strongly for Macron than anybody in the age bracket from um, 24 to 65 did. So they they showed a lot of Republican responsibility, if you want to be very French. Yeah. So I'm not even that worried about that generation. But I think when you talk to them is that they feel like a, a real urgent sense of crisis. And it's much more urgent for them than um, for, for the older generations. But is it that same urgency in Germany also now, do you think? Is there that sense of urgency, you mean? Yes, in Germany. Um, even, even more strongly so, I would say, when it comes to the climate question, but less strongly so when it comes to social justice, which is also because um, young German people are simply better off than French German than French young people because they they have better better perspectives when it comes to employment and for possibly having a nicer future. So we can't underestimate um, the the role that unemployment, even though it's true it didn't play a role in this election, but it does play a role when you look at how how do young French people feel, and a lot of them feel like they do not have a very very bright future. So it, it feels unfair to me to blame them for the rise r possible rise of autocrats when we might not be doing enough for giving them the feeling that the bright future is ahead of them. What I find quite striking is that uh, there were so few um, young people who were prepared to vote for Le Pen in the first round, considering that she said that uh, one of her first uh, priorities was going to be um, eliminating all income taxes for people under the age of 30. I don't think anyone took us seriously. <laughs> <laughs> they well, that's another. I think they wondered if they country was going to go bankrupt. Right. Well, if they were smart, they would have. In fact, that was probably the one the one failing of, of Macron that in the in that in that election was was in the debate rather was to say, I'd say Man, do you understand that you're going to bankrupt this country if all of your pro problems go, issues go through anyway? OK, next yeah, question. Yeah, there's a... all the foreigners, then you. Yeah. But that was her basic logic and people understood that they were like we're not going to go bankrupt because we're going to take it all away from our arab right. neighbor so right that it was a racist campaign based on that so. yeah mm -hmm. we have a question on zoom this is from william holstein um so we've talked about ukraine we've talked about america another big player of course in the world moving forward will be china he asks what are the implications of macron's victory for Euro uh, european relations with china there was already a chill in the air over Ukraine. What now? Uh, Bill Holstein being one of the pillars of the Overseas Press Club. Great. I think Victor might want to take that, right? Yes. I, mean, I, I mean, just very briefly, I mean, I think Macron, um, we were talking you know, about how he's going to be more powerful in Europe. And I think this election means that he will be able to push the message that Europe needs to be more powerful industrially and in a defense you know strategic sense and economically um, to stand up to the other superpowers which is essentially China and and the US and and that has been you know validated if you like by um, well first of all by recent events and then you know he's he's now been uh, re-elected and I think that that's that's where we stand so I mean I don't think China will be upset that he's been re-elected but it but in fact, Marine Le Pen was kind of hostile towards China in, in being friendly towards Russia. She said, we need to be friendly to Russia so that Russia doesn't fall into China's hands. So I don't think China will sort of care much one way or the other, but it just strengthens Europe's hand in you know, negotiating with, 
with China and, and with the US and just making Europe more powerful in a sense. I think that's the main, yeah. the main effect. Yeah. More questions in the room, possibly? From the room, come on, someone. There we go. From the youth. A young person we want to hear from the, We want to hear from the disenchanted youth. <laughs> Did you vote? In the I can't. I can't, sadly. Um, to no avail. Um, I actually wanted to ask something more on the general scheme of things with regards to EU. The foreign policy, you did touch upon it with William's question about how foreign policy, I think even with the exit of Merkel, we can say that, and with Putin now doing his things with uh, Ukraine, to me personally, I think as a young person, liberal democracy right now and the idea of diplomacy and negotiations and sanctions doesn't seem as effective as it used to be. And I was just wondering, what do you think about, and I know you've touched upon it before, but with pooling sovereignty and with rising nationalism in every European country we know, I'm half from Czech Republic and I mean, populism ravaged the country and as you can see in Hungary and everywhere. But as Eastern Europe specifically, we still see, we still feel neglected in a way by EU and I guess the global order when it comes to things like Putin, just or like Hitler, or with Russia in the past, we just see him taking things. And I think offensive realism now, I think as well with foreign policy in Germany, that's gonna be on the rise now. So that's my, I guess my question is, what is the future foreign policy with regards to offensive realism in the EU as a reaction to people or brutes as some people called him like Putin, where the answer isn't a diplomacy anymore. Well, I, I, what I find by the way, quite extra extraordinary, you mentioned populism in, in Eastern Europe on Sunday, most people didn't even recognize this. Like there was an election in Slovenia and the populist candidate there went down to a dramatic defeat after two or three terms in office, uh, was just basically thrown out the same day that um, Marine Le Pen was, leaving basically only Viktor Orban in Hungary, who was in a very unusual and peculiar position there. And I know Hungary well. I used to cover it for Eastern, for the New York Times from Eastern Europe. Um, that's a peculiar place. But um, uh, the fact is that I'm not sure that, that um, really that... Uh, that uh, populism is that popular anywhere in Europe these days, even especially among young people. So, um, but I'd like to love to hear from any of the rest of you. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I'm also sort of wondering whether I'm out of touch or something, but I, I also have doubts about the kind of whole narrative of the sweep of populist nationalism, given that there's equally this massive push back against it. And it's not just um, at the voting booths, you know, on Sunday and so in, clearly in these two elections in, in Europe, but it's also um, what's come out of the, um, both the COVID crisis and also the war in Ukraine, where Europe acted in a way that was so kind of um, uh, contrary to what the way they've been acting in recent years, where with this, incredible unity, you know, deciding to um, have this massive sort of unified budget, crisis budget that they were gonna pass in, in Brussels, exactly the kind of thing that Macron was pushing for, for before and couldn't get very far. And now the whole reemergence of NATO, um, you know, an organization which Macron only a couple of years ago had called brain dead. Um, so, I'm a little bit more hopeful, I guess. Okay, I, I would like to um, take the time to ask each of our panelists yep. now. Um, final uh, question. Want to do one final thing before we wind up? I'd like to each of have each of you tell us, and, and we'll, we'll promise not to, to to leak it to any other news organization. What is the next story you're going to be writing? <laughs> Sarah, do you want to begin? Sure, as I don't really know at the moment because I'm depending on what will Macron do this week. But obviously, well, this week is a bit special because as uh, Sunday is a jour férié, it's is férié, so we can't sell our newspapers on Sunday, so we have to finish it on Friday. <laughs> well, no, that's all right. Our, our cuisine. Um, well, I think I'll be working on the, the next government because uh, we are expecting expecting our next prime minister and next ministers uh, in maybe next week. 
<laughs> if only my life would be much easier. <laughs> well, if if I had to make a bet today, maybe if, if you ask me tomorrow, I won't say the same, but today I think Julien de Normandie is in good place because it's very close to um, Emmanuel Macron. He tr they trust each other and uh, and he wants his um, yeah, agriculture minister. And so, well, yes, the next government and how um, LROM and its allies are preparing the parliamentary elections. Uh, for me, three things, I think, uh, you know, Macron's and possibly Scholz's visit to Kiev in the next few days. I think that it's quite likely to happen. Um, probably not, because they'll probably do it in secret. I don't know. That's certainly what Austin and, uh, and Blinken did. Uh, but maybe, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, if, if they let us, yes, I guess that would be, that would be great. Um, and then, yeah, the same thing, the, the prime minister, you know, whoever he's going to choose as the prime minister and sort of looking, sorry? Uh, not really. I mean, I, you know, the only thing is I, I'm very skeptical about the idea that it would be Christine Lagarde, which a lot of people have suggested, because it seems to me it wouldn't make sense for her and it wouldn't make sense for Macron. So I, but, but amazing numbers of people say that it will be her, but I, I don't think so, but I, I may be completely wrong. Um, and then, yeah, the, looking a bit further ahead, the legislative elections, the National Assembly elections, and all the kind of, we've, we've been discussing this, but all the twists and turns of, you know, who, who are these three groups that might end up uh, competing for the election? You know, the center around Macron, the far left or the left around Mélenchon and the socialists and the Greens, and then the far right around um, Marine Le Pen and, and Zemmour's crowd who they're not getting on at the moment. Yeah. Um, I'm taking a break from news this week and writing a, <laughs> writing a story that I should have finished a while ago um, about a woman, a 40 year old woman who found out that her father um, worked for the F FNL, the, the um, Algerian Liberation uh, Front. And it's a story about how um which now becomes important again with Macron's second term like how will he um try and continue on his uh on même temps uh, path of trying to reconcile the Harkis so the people who the um Algerians who were fighting on France's side with the people who were fighting and we, well, you have these three. I'm sorry. I'm also. I spoke too much French in the last days. I'm, I'm <laughs> having trouble. But um, yes, I'll be writing about Algeria. <laughs> <laughs> Which one do you want? <laughs> I, I'll take this one. Does work, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm not too sure uh, what's next, um, but certainly we've. I think for all of us, have spent the last few months in this kind of complete whirlwind of uh, two major stories, the Ukraine war and the French elections. And I think it's time to kind of step back a little bit and do, um, you know, more stories about, uh, you know, meet more feature stories about how, what's going on in France, what's going on in all the places of the country we never get to. And um, in terms of, uh, the post-election, I think we should be looking a lot at what's going to happen in um, in Europe with the, the next round of Russia sanctions, which is going to be really a key issue, maybe a key battle. And, um, and I would be most interested to do some reporting about who is saying what about the exit plan from the war. Okay. My next story has nothing to do with Europe or America. It has to do with the Philippine people deciding on May 9th to uh, ensconce as their new president, Bongbong Marcos. That's his name, Bongbong Marcos, the son of uh, Ferdinand and Imelda Marcos, who is running and apparently has over 50% of the vote right now polling because the people of the Philippines admire uh, everything he stands for, which is hard to believe, but um, uh, so that's what I'm going to be focusing on. A real, a not only a populist, a a proto dictator in in waiting, and and certainly with the genetic makeup of a one of the 
two most extraordinary dictators in the history of certainly of Asia, perhaps of the world, uh, the Marcos family coming back to power, thanks to Bong Bong. Mm -hmm.